Good morning, everyone. My name is Arden, and welcome to Allura Road Online Services. We are so glad that you're joining us here today. We would love for you to stay connected on our Facebook community page as well as our Instagram page. Kids, don't forget you have your very own special Zoom with Mr. Jake at 2 p.m. and the link for that will be on our Facebook page as well. For right now, let's join together and worship with our team. Sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope but no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given in me My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Least for my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. Faithfully born, he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, oh your grace so free washes over. Rejoiced as though heaven had arrived. But then Jesus arose without freedom in hell. That's when death was arrested, my life began. That's when death was.
It was October 3rd, 2006, and Corporal Jim Mitchell was with his unit serving in Kandahar province of Afghanistan when an ambush took place by Taliban insurgents and my nephew, Jim, my namesake, was killed. Jim was the oldest of two boys. I can't imagine the pain and the grief that my sister and my brother-in-law faced at the loss of their oldest son, Jim, then to compound the pain and the suffering, it was less than three months later when their second son, Mark, died of cancer. Within three short months, my sister and her husband lost both of their children. I, I can't even begin to fathom the depth of sorrow and pain and confusion that that would bring upon a person and a couple. I, I sincerely hope that those that are watching never experience that depth of loss and grief and sorrow. But the truth is, to some degree, to some level or another, all of us are going to face trauma and difficulty and challenges, pain and suffering that really is the human condition. And all too often, we take the things from the past that have caused us the trauma and the hurt, and we bring them into our present, and they become obstacles for us to live healthy lives today. And really, that's what this series is all about, Win the Day by Mark Batterson. And it is looking at habits, not the kinds of habits that we, uh, you know, check a list off every day that I'm going to wake up at a certain time and I'm going to do certain activities, but rather ways of looking, ways of understanding that are biblical and that help us to be able to apprehend and use the wonderful truths that were made available because of the gospel of Jesus. And Jesus came to give us abundant life for each day. And when we focus on the day in which we live, then we have uh, at our disposal wonderful tools to, to live in joy and in peace. But again, so often things from the past affect us, and become obstacles for our day. And last week we learned about flipping the script, changing the, the voices and the stories that we tell about ourselves and about our life so that we can find out what the truth of our identity is that, that Jesus describes for us. This week we're looking at uh, what, what we're terming kissing the wave, and we'll talk about what that means in, in a couple of moments. But essentially, it ref references and refers to the things from our past that we've not really dealt with and that uh, the, the cross of Jesus and the resurrection gave us the ability to have victory over uh, all of the pain from the past. And yet, it's not enough just to know it. We have to put it into practice. Romans 8, 28 and 29 tell us that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. That's verse number 28. We often are thinking about things from today and all of the things from today, God somehow is going to use it for our good. And of course, that is true, but it also refers to everything from the past. Verse 29 of Romans chapter 8 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In other words, those of us who love Jesus, we have been called by God, and God knew us before we knew him. He knew us from our mother's womb when we were living our lives, and he wasn't involved in our life yet to that point. He was there. And so when we think about our past, and we think about all the pain and the suffering from our past, verse 28 and 29 of Romans chapter 8 are telling us that God is able to take all of the, the terribly bad things and from the very beginning, he predestined to weave all of those things to benefit our lives. Now, verse 28 um, 
it tells us all things work together for good to those that love God. Well, there's two very important things that it does not say. It doesn't say that all things that happen to us are good. And the reality is that some of you have suffered terrible things, much, much like I've described about my, my sister and her, and her husband. Uh, terrible, difficult things. There's nothing good about them. And yet God is able to take them and work some good out of them for our benefit. And the second thing is not for everyone, but it's for those who are loving God and are called by God. Romans 8, 28 and 29, incredible verses for us to, to understand. Uh, most often when we face the difficulties of life, we're trying to get out of the pain as soon as possible. And what God wants us to remember is that He is with us. And instead of just trying to get out of the pain, God wants us to get something out of the pain and to recognize that he is in it and that we can meet Jesus in the midst of our of our pain and sorrow and difficulty and learn something about him and learn uh, some character quality something that we would never have known otherwise because he is there for us it was 1856 and Charles Spurgeon was a young preacher. He had just been called and hired to be pastor of the new London Metropolitan Tabernacle. That, that church would later go on to become the first mega church in the modern world, having over 10,000 members. And yet at this point in time, uh, Charles was just a, a young preacher, just newly married, less than a year, and he had two twin sons that were just days old when he was asked to preach in front of this large group in an, in an auditorium in London. Uh, the text that he preached from was Proverbs 3, verse 33, that says, The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. And as he was starting to preach to this crowd of 10,000 people, someone stood and yelled, Fire! Pandemonium broke out. Chaos. Panic. People were stampeding. And as a matter of fact, one of the balconies collapsed. And at the end of the event, seven people had died and 28 people had been seriously injured. Well, the man who would eventually later in his life be called the Prince of of preachers came very close to never preaching again. That event and, and the sorrow and the agony that it brought plagued Spurgeon for the rest of his life and he was subject to depression and melancholy. And it was said that even years later he'd be preaching somewhere and there'd be something about the setting that reminded him of that evening and he would pause for a long periods of time as he tried to regain his composure. He certainly never preached from that text again. The Prince of Preachers was, it, it was like life came on him and the, the challenges and difficulties and sorrow and grief that it brought, it was like a storm just engulfed him. And, and the waves of circumstance and the wind of sorrow just battered against him. And it was later that Charles Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I have learned to kiss the wave that has thrown me against the rock of ages. Well, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. It not only has application for every one of us today, there, there's actually an Old Testament equivalent, and it's the story of Joseph. And, and if you remember Joseph, uh, popularized by Disney movies, I think so many of us know his story. As a 17-year-old, possibly spoiled, entitled, uh, rich young man, uh, because of the dysfunction of his family and his father especially, 
uh, Joseph was favored above the rest of his brothers and they hated him and they were jealous because of the favoritism that his father so lavishly bestowed upon him. And at the age of 17, his brothers took him and throw, threw him in, into this, this pit. It's, it's like an empty well. It was dried up and they threatened to kill him. And if you know the story, you find out that the betrayal uh, really took place when a caravan of, of foreign slave traders passed by and the brother sold Joseph into slavery and he was taken to, to Egypt. He didn't know the culture, the people, he didn't know the language. He, he left the love of his father, betrayed by the people that were supposed to care for him and love him. And later on in his life, we, we know that Joseph would, would improve and then other dire things would happen and he would end up in prison and calamity upon calamity. And yet Joseph continued to trust in God. A Spurgeon would say that Joseph learned to kiss the wave that threw him upon the rock of ages to finally, as, as you know the story, he was miraculously elevated to become the vizier, the, like the prime minister of Egypt. And, and years later, he met his brothers again. And he said to them in Genesis chapter 50, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And God was there and, and, and took the, the very obstacle in his life that could have embittered him with rage and, and anguish and bitterness for the rest of his life being thrown into the pit. And yet that very obstacle wasn't his enemy. It became the pathway to his destiny and to his future. He learned to kiss the wave that threw him upon the rock of ages. It was 1911 and the Swiss psychologist Edward Claparède, uh, who we will call Dr. Ed, Edward Claparède had a 47-year-old woman who was, uh, it came to him for help because she had no recall of immediate events. She had absolutely no short-term memory. Every therapy session that this woman came to Dr. Ed for, she would reach out her hand and introduce herself because she had no recollection of any short-term events that had taken place, no memory of any event. So Dr. Ed thought that he would do an experiment. And so he put a needle between his fingers. And the next time she introduced him, herself to him at the next therapy session she shook his hand and immediately was stung by the the pain of this needle uh, nowadays he would be up before the ethics commission and certainly there would be a lawsuit that he had to deal with but he got away with it in 1911 in minutes however the memory of that event was gone and there was no recollection that it had ever happened but the next time she came for another session, she refused to shake his hand. She had no idea why, but she somehow felt that she couldn't trust him. And I like to say that many Christians have the same experience with their relationship with God. There are things in the past where they have been disappointed by God. They've been in their in their minds disappointed by God that things that have happened to them that have hurt them and they may not have any direct recollection of what it is that happened but somehow it has affected their trust in God and they find themselves in their present day unable to really trust God well six months ago or so I did uh, an exercise and I, I call it the life timeline and I'd like to show it to you and explain it to you and encourage you to do the same thing. And basically it is just, just a timeline and you draw a horizontal line across a page and on the, the left hand side you start with your, your first memories and you go all the way to however old you are. 
And then as you start as a, as a youngster, your first memories, you put lines going from the, the, the middle horizontal line going up that are positive events that happened to you when, when you were young and lines going down are the, the negative events, the bad things that happened. And as you take the time to go through your life and you catalog the, the good things that happened to you and, and if they're really good things, they're, they're big lines and if they're really bad things, then they become big lines along the bottom. And, and for me, I've, I've got one here. I was 22 years old and my father died. And it was an aneurysm and it was sudden and there was, there was no hint uh, of any sickness or thing that was going to happen. And, and as I remember back, other memories start cascading. And I remember uh, that that day when I left for university, I was my, my, I think my fourth year of university. And I don't remember saying goodbye to my dad. And the next thing I know, my dad has died and I never got to say goodbye. And, and then when I, was, when I was 36 years old, my mother died and that was the first time any of my children had ever seen me cry, the death of my mother. And, and it goes on and there's other things that are, are great and joyous and there are other things that are, are sad and I, I felt betrayed and I felt wounded and I, and on and on it goes and, and you'll have the same experiences. And what happens with the truth of Romans 8, 28 and 29 is that before I even knew God was in my life, He was there and I was predetermined. You, He knew you before you were born while you were wo being woven in your mother's womb. And everything that happened, he wants to work for good. Well, it was within the last month or two, Carrie and I were having a conversation about finances, I think, and I recognized something going on in my heart. And I, I recognized that there was a thought that was plaguing me that, that I had suffered from and, and this thought was actually a lie. And here's, here's how the lie sounded. God cannot be trusted because he's not going to take care of you. And he's not going to watch over you and he's not going to provide for you. And terrible things are going to happen because you can't provide for yourself either. You can't now and you never could. Well, when I think about that lie, how... How did that get lodged there? Ephesians 6 talks about the fiery arrows of the devil and how we're supposed to lift up the shield of faith to stop them. But without being able to identify what's happening, we can't exercise the shield of faith and lift it up to stop it. And so when I think about that lie, I, I trace it back to certain events that had happened in the past. And, and there were times when I, I thought I was trusting God and I was disappointed by God and disappointed by people and what, what I hoped was going to happen didn't happen. And fear took over in a particular areas of my life and, and a fiery dart, a lie was lodged there and it would kind of be activated every once in a while. As, I, as I've been thinking about these things and about the truth of Romans 8 and the things from the past and how God wants to work all of them for our good and, and remove the obstacles that, I, that I'm facing today, I recognize that there, there was this lie and, and I, I mentioned it to Carrie. I, I have my own personal pastor, uh, Pastor Ken Miles, and I, I was talking, actually there's three different areas in, in my heart that I, I have to watch out for and, and I shared it w with them so that they could pray for me. And, and of course I went to the Word of God because the Word of God brings us the truth that sets us free from these lies. And, it, and again, think of 2 Corinthians uh, 10 verse 4 and, and bringing captive every, every thought through the obedience of Christ. And so when I think about this lie, you can't trust God. Well, it is a lie. And Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 11 
that if, if you be parents, that in comparison to the goodness of God are, are evil, if you being evil parents know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father want to give good things to those that ask Him? And then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's what the truth is. And so when I'm faced with this obstacle, and, and the obstacle is, it's, it's, it's a lie. It's going through my mind. And it's saying, you, you can't really trust God in these practical areas. Well, I go back to the past, to the disappointments. And that obstacle, it's not my enemy anymore because it's throwing me into the arms of Jesus and reminding me that He loves to give good things to me. He loves to lavish my life with blessing exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. And so like Spurgeon has said, I am learning to kiss the wave that throws me upon the rock of ages. Well, I've, I've got three things I just love for you to do. This one's going to take a bit of time, but it is so worth it. I, I'd love for you to, to make your own lifetime line and draw that line and start from your earliest memories and catalog the, the great things that have happened in your life and, and the, the hurtful things, the painful things. And if you haven't thought about them, remember that at those times when you weren't aware of it, Jesus was there with you. And there is something good that he's going to work in your life because of those things. And kiss the wave that has thrown you upon the rock of ages. You are who you are today. Not just because of the great joys that have taken place in your life, but because of the deep sorrows. And God has revealed His love to you in all of those things. The second thing I love you to do is to commit to memory Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, He predetermined, predestined, to be conformed to the image of His Son. And third, I'd like you to think deeply about what it means and reflect on your past so that you can kiss the wave that has thrown you upon the Rock of Ages. God bless. Thank you so much.